well-known passage, Matthew chapter 5. Where Jesus starts the Sermon on the Mount with what's commonly called the Beatitudes, or what Billy Graham calls the beautiful attitudes. <laughs> <coughs> and when Jesus saw the multitudes, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. And opening his mouth, he began to teach them, saying, Blessed or happy are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. <coughs> Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely on account of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. <clears throat> Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of your Holy Spirit as our teacher. <clears throat> and we pray now that as we come to your word, that you would feed us with the bread of life. We pray that we would be open and responsive to whatever you have to say to us this morning. I pray that you would use my lips as your instrument and all of our ears to be receptive to your word. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We've been focusing on the new year, but I'm sure it's only... It is only a week, isn't it, since Christmas happened? And um, I, everybody will have undoubtedly been wishing you a very happy Christmas. Now it's a happy new year. Um, but have you ever considered what exactly would make it a happy Christmas or a happy new year? in what lies ahead for you. What things need to happen, or indeed not happen, if this coming year is going to be a happy one in your life? <clears throat> Some years ago, um, the late Queen famously had what she called an, an Annus Horribilis. And, um, Probably most of us have had more than one of those in our lives at some stage. But we stand on the brink of 2023, hoping that this coming year will not be one of them. Can I ask you just to mentally complete this sentence in your mind as I begin? The sentence is, my life would be fine just as long as I have what? I will be okay as long as I what? 
whatever that thing is that you mentally finished the sentence with, that is likely your first number one aspiration for 2023. But can I say to you that unless that aspiration is the Lord Jesus Christ, whatever you put in at the end of that sentence won't give you lasting happiness. <clears throat> what is it in life that guarantees this elusive thing called happiness? And the vast majority of people and spend life searching for happiness without really knowing where to find it. In most cases, happiness depends upon their happenings. And if their happenings don't happen the way they want them to happen, they are unhappy. Some people spend time organizing their happenings to make sure that everything happens the way they want it to happen. And the old English word happiness um, is derived um, from the word hap, which means chance. And so happiness for many people depends entirely on, to coin a word, chanciness. <clears throat> Whether or not your luck is in, in terms of health and wealth and family and so on. The assumption is this. If they can somehow make everything happen the way they want, they will be happy. And the obvious problem with that is that you can't do it. Because many things are totally outside of your control. It only takes a second for your life to be totally changed or totally ended. And in a year full of seconds, Anything can happen. And yet people today talk, we actually talk about a right to happiness. Uh, C.S. Lewis uh, picked up on that um, quite a number of years ago. And, and he said this, At first, this sounds to me as odd as a right to good luck. Remember the English meaning of the English word hat, chance? He, kept, he says, For I believe whatever one school of moralists may say, that we depend for a very great deal of our happiness or misery on circumstances outside human control. A right to happiness doesn't for me make much more sense than a right to be six feet tall or to have a millionaire for your father, or to get good weather whenever you want to have a picnic. Because that word happiness in the old English sense is built on, based on chance. But the Greek word for happiness, as it's used in the New Testament, is the word makarios and it's translated as blessed or happy in our English Bibles and Jesus expounded on this word and he said stuff here which will absolutely blow your mind when you think about it listen to what he said here on this in the Sermon on the Mount Blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed, happy, are those who mourn. 
Happy are the meek. Blessed or happy are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. Blessed are the merciful. Blessed are the pure in heart. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness. And Jesus is saying that happiness or makarios, having everything just wonderful, comes not from having everything. It can come through being poor, through mourning, through hungering, through thirsting. It can come through being persecuted for righteousness sake. <coughs> now that is exactly the opposite <coughs> of what we think is the road to happiness. Blessed are the poor. We would say blessed are the rich. Blessed are those who mourn. We would say blessed are those who laugh. Blessed are the gentle or the meek. We would say blessed are the proud and the confident and the assertive. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst. And we, are, we would say blessed are those who don't hunger and don't thirst because they've got everything. And yet there is a fascinating logic in these eight Beatitudes that I'd like you to reflect on now as we go through them. <coughs> because the first leads logically to the second, which leads logically to the third, and then logically to the fourth. And all of these Beatitudes are to do with relationships. The first four concern our relationship with God. And the second four concern our relationship with each other, with one another. And it is in that order. Now the, the challenge of these verses lies in the fact that Jesus is stressing that God-given happiness comes to those who sort out their relationships, who put their relationships both with God and with other people in the right. And it's a lovely testimony that Veronica shared a, um, a minute or two ago about a relationship that's been put right. You see, true happiness is found only by entrance into God's kingdom. And what does that mean? It means simply that you come and become a subject of the king. Only by acknowledging him as king, coming into his sphere of life, coming under <coughs> his rule, coming under his authority, coming under his blessing. That is the only place where true happiness occurs. You remember, I think it was Augustine who said, God, you have made us for yourself, and our hearts are restless until they find their rest in thee. You could insert the word happiness. Um, our happiness is found when we find our place in relationship with God in his kingdom. And so any offering of happiness <coughs> that the Bible makes is really a summons to the kingdom. 
When Jesus said, if you, <clears throat> you will be happy if you do this. Happy are you if you do that. Happy are you if you are the other. He is really saying, this is how you enter the kingdom. And there is where you find the happiness. So you have here not only teaching about how to be happy, but teaching about how to enter the kingdom. Because they are the same thing. Entering the kingdom is where happiness is found. And outside the kingdom of God, there is no lasting happiness. And the first step in entering the kingdom, the first step to happiness, Jesus says here, is being poor in spirit. Realizing your own spiritual poverty, your own sin nature. And the second one is mourning over it. The third one is humbly falling down before the glory of God in your condition of spiritual poverty. And then the fourth one is then pleading for a righteousness which you don't have and which you hunger for. That's a succinct summary of how you become a Christian. And once those four things are done, <coughs> then that begins to manifest itself in an attitude of mercy towards others, a pursuit of purity and peacemaking in your own life, and that then creates hostility in the wider world. Because the second four, you remember, are to do with relationships with others, yourself. That is the flow of the Beatitudes. There's a progression in the sense that one flows on from the other. And if you make searching for happiness your starting point, then it will elude you. Search for God wholeheartedly and you will be found by Him. The Bible guarantees that. If you seek me, you will find me. If you seek me with your whole heart. And happiness is then thrown in as a byproduct. This is basic Christian teaching, and it needs to be emphasized that the whole purpose of the Gospel is not simply to make us feel happy. And yet, sadly, even a large number of Christians today <coughs> seem to get this wrong, big time. One of the many pseudo-gospels that circulates in the church in the present time could be summed up in the strap line, come to Jesus and he will make you happy. That is a grossly misleading misrepresentation. Especially as Jesus clearly forewarned his disciples. He said, in the world... You will have tribulation. You will have big trouble. The genuine gospel can, I think, much more accurately be conveyed in the line, Come to Jesus and he will make you holy. Because remember, the Holy Spirit is not called the happy spirit, but the Holy Spirit. Now it is certainly true that there is a connection between happiness and holiness. It is the lack of holiness in our lives that is ultimately the root cause of most unhappiness. 
But in our naivety, we tend to get things the wrong way round. God's primary will for us in this world is... God's primary will for us is holiness in this world <coughs> and happiness in the next world. But vast numbers of Christians seem to have got the idea that Christianity is all about being happy in this world and holy in the next world. <laughs> and so many sermons and messages we hear today are all about <coughs> your own happiness and peace, and satisfaction, and having all your desires met. This is the cult of the therapeutic. How can I be successful, and happy, and satisfied, and prosperous? And this is what we hear so often, sadly, in much of the church. It is all about self, self-satisfaction, self-fulfillment, personal happiness. And if we are pursuing the material kind of happiness, we're pursuing something that is for the moment, rather than something that is going to carry us through all of life's moments and for eternity. You see, there is this perverted kind of gospel doing the rounds today. <clears throat> Whereby spiritual health is associated with wealth. The more wealthy you are today, the more evidence, supposedly, you give of having entered into the prosperity of the gospel. And we're not necessarily talking about material things at all in Matthew chapter 5. Being poor or being rich has nothing to do with it. There were many poor people, and there still are, who come into the kingdom. And there are a few rich people. Not many, but a few. Nicodemus and Joseph of Arimathea were wealthy men, as apparently was Philemon. But that is not the prerequisite. Neither is health or emotional well-being. There is nothing wrong with any of those things. They're all desirable. They're valuable, they are positive things. But it's possible to have all of these things and not have eternal happiness. <clears throat> so if you answered my question earlier on by saying life would be fine for you in 2023, if you just had, and you mentioned any of those things, I'm afraid you've got the wrong starting point. And neither is the root of New Year resolutions going to do much for you either. Um, people are still besotted with New Year resolutions that last on average for about 10 days. Because most of us, we aspire, don't we, to a genuine transformation in at least some areas of our lives. And yet self-reformation is not the path to happiness. It's usually the path to disappointment. Because the flesh is willing, <coughs> the spirit may be willing, but the flesh is weak. We try to change and we fail. We fail so many times that we're tempted really just to despair. We give up trying. And you've maybe heard the, the little rhyme. When I was young, I set my goal as far as I could see. But now I'm nearer to my goal, I've moved it nearer me. 
what we often do. So happiness doesn't come really by good intentions or simply by the power of positive thinking. I can think of one prosperity preacher who, who said, quote, to find happiness, stop focusing on what's wrong with you and start focusing on what's right with you. And no, that is not the way it works at all. That is not even remotely biblical. We are to focus on God and God alone and seek after holiness, without which the Bible says no one will see God. And as a byproduct of doing that, peace and happiness follow on. <clears throat> but we are never told to seek after or to put happiness as the first priority or to believe that we can somehow find it by focusing on self. God cannot give us happiness and peace apart from himself because it's not there. There is no such thing. And as I say, this is actually fairly basic Christian understanding. And yet we have a generation of Christian teachers and preachers, um, many of whom have totally lost this. And they are preaching a me-centered gospel, which can only disappoint. A focus on self, on our wants, on our desires, and our lusts, is exactly what Satan wants us to do, but not God. Allow me, <coughs> if you will, to read just a few of the verses in the Bible that speak of how happiness comes about. There is Psalm 146 and verse 5. <coughs> Happy is he that has the God of Jacob for his help, whose hope is in the Lord his God. Proverbs chapter 16 and verse 20. Whoever gives heed to instruction prospers, and happy is he who trusts in the Lord. Proverbs chapter 3, where <coughs> the writer is personifying wisdom and uh, Jesus Christ is is being personified in um, these verses <clears throat> but it talks about wisdom in, in terms she will guide you down delightful paths all her ways are satisfying wisdom is a tree of life to those who embrace her happy happy are those who hold her tightly and Psalm 128, <coughs> how happy is everyone who fears the Lord, who walks in his ways. The French writer and politician Victor Hugo once said, the supreme happiness in life is the conviction that we are loved. And it is at the cross and nowhere else that you and I can know that we are loved by God. That you and I can know that we are reconciled to God through the cross of the Lord Jesus. And it is only at the cross that we have the power to love one another to forgive one another, to be reconciled <coughs> with one another. And if that's your experience today, then there is a sense that whatever happens to you in this coming year, 
that lies ahead. It will be a happy one, a blessed one, because in Christ you will be fulfilling his purposes and receiving his grace and growing in his holiness. But happiness is the byproduct. Seek the holiness and you get the happiness as the byproduct. <clears throat> if our goal is to be Christ like, then a happy new year for us will consist in us becoming more like Him. Happiness on its highest level is not found in what comes to us, but in what we come to be ourselves. And that's what the Beatitudes are all about. Jesus knew the importance of being happy, and that's why he begins his greatest sermon with a list of ways to be perfectly happy on earth for those who would follow him and who would be citizens of his kingdom. You see, the most important thing for me about 2022 and I guess probably for you as well, <clears throat> is not what we did, but what we became. Whether your life was exciting and you went round the whole world and you did this and you did that and you did the other, <coughs> <coughs> you know, we often get these um, circular round-robin Christmas letters um, outlining everything that this person or this family have done during the last year. And they've been there and they've done this and they've got the t-shirt for that. And, um, and you can end up thinking to yourself, I didn't get any of that. Um, but it doesn't matter whether you were stuck at home, whether you were struggling with family problems, or having a seemingly never-ending calendar of medical appointments, or whatever has been thrown at you in the last 12 months. The important thing is not what you did, but what you became. And when you're frustrated about your circumstances, and you hear about these exciting, distant, exotic places that people are flying off to and having great holidays and so on, or going even on pilgrimages to Israel, and, and, and other exciting things that people do. When you hear about that and you're tempted to think, oh, yeah, I'm just stuck here, <clears throat> just remember that at the end of the day, God will say, not what did you do? He will say, what did you become? Some of, <clears throat> some of you will be looking back over this last year and you'll be thinking, thank goodness. Thank goodness 2022 is over. Because you have been through deep waters over these last few months. You've had heartaches, maybe even tragedies. And those things may be what are uppermost in your mind as you look back. But is it possible that even those painful times have served to bring you closer to the Lord Jesus? We are very familiar, I'm sure, <clears throat> with that famous verse that speaks of how in all things God works for good in those who love him. Romans 8 and verse 28. But you know, whenever that verse is quoted, it's very rarely the case that the next verse after it is also quoted which is verse 29 
And it's that verse that tells us in what way things can work out for good. Romans 8.29 says, In order to conform you to the image of Jesus Christ. Did you realize that the trials and the tribulations that you encounter are designed to make you more like Jesus? Perhaps they have made you more dependent on him. Perhaps they have somehow strengthened your faith in the testings which you have undergone in this last year. And in so doing, they have made you more like Jesus. It doesn't really matter whether you are rich or poor this coming year. It doesn't really matter whether you have a lot of friends or a few. It doesn't really matter whether you get a better job <coughs> or you stay doing the same work which you have done for the last however many years. What matters is what you will become in 2023. God's desire is for you to be conformed in greater measure to the image of Jesus Christ. And for some of us, that may entail times of testing, challenges, and trials. Things that we think are the absolute antithesis of happiness. But actually, if they serve to make us more like Jesus, we will find that in the context of eternity, we have a closer walk with him than we've ever had before. You see, the challenges and the trials of this life <coughs> prepare us for the day when we will stand before Jesus. Can you imagine standing before Jesus, before the one who suffered so much to secure our salvation. The one who was flogged and beaten and spat upon and persecuted and crucified. Can you imagine standing before him, never having suffered yourself? When you are going through deep waters with Christ, then you're able to say, with much deeper gratitude and appreciation. Jesus, thank you for dying for me. Because since I have suffered a little bit on earth, I have a better understanding of how deep your pain must have been. And therefore how great your love must be. I hope that most of us can say that today. We are now, right, on day one of 2023. <clears throat> Can I ask you the question which I've had to ask my heart? And it's simply this. How much did you grow in 2022? Not what did you do or what places you visited or interesting experiences you've had. But how much did you grow? If you grew, then the year has been worthwhile. If you didn't grow, <coughs> it's been a sheer waste of time. You see, the real need is for a new you, a new me. New years come and go. But if the new year brings a new you, that's the change that we need. Circumstances may vary. <clears throat> but if by the grace of God we're given a new heart, a new mind, a new heavenly perspective, 
then whatever else happens this year will be something that we can handle better. And Jesus wishes to each of his followers not only a happy new year, but a perpetually happy new life. Jesus <coughs> expected his disciples to be the happiest people on earth. But it's not the common human perception of happiness. It is a joy that is not dependent on outward circumstances. It's a joy that the world cannot give. And it comes from fixing our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen. The Apostle Paul reminds us, <clears throat> what is seen is temporary, what is unseen is eternal. If you want a good memory verse to kick off the year with, <clears throat> that's a great one. Can I close by reminding you of how <clears throat> at the end of the Christmas story, in Luke chapter 2, it says this, Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and man. And if you are to measure the growth and progress in your own life, you must measure it not by what you did, but by what you became, what you will become this year. We sang at Christmas those words from the, <coughs> the Christmas carol. For he is our childhood's pattern. Day by day, like us, he grew. May God grant that it may be said of us at the end of 2023. <coughs> if we're still here, or if the Lord hasn't come, by then. But in this year, day by day, like him, we grew. Amen. Amen.